be fit to parent some of your children, but not all of your children. Because that would be because my my client had married during this time period, had a subsequent child, may have even had two, I'm not sure yet, I think yeah, I know he had at least one, and the court made it clear that you can the trial court can make a finding that you're you're fit to parent some of your children, but not all of your children. So it was a, it's a very interesting case, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, you should be very proud of it. That's I find it quite tragic, though, that um, it, it sounds like there's a little economic injustice there. And ironically, that I don't know anything about these people at all, but you know, when someone tells me they're a plumber and a HVAC technician, I know that they're sort of going to be employed. Um, <laughs> And like some of us sometimes, I mean, that, that's actually, that's that's good work. It may not be work that requires the same education that some of us have, but it does require education nonetheless. Um, so what, um, what do you think will be the most challenging thing for you as a judge sitting on the bench? Um, one, of the, one of the mechanisms that I think is gonna be the, is, the, is the volume of cases. Yeah. And, and um, this, you know, I, I'm a believer in justice delays, justice denied mm -hmm. for a lot of people. And these cases that come to the probate and family court, are, the vast majority of them are urgent in nature yeah. because we're talking about the safety <coughs> of children, we're talking about living arrangements. Um, there's many of them are such urgent issues. I think the biggest challenge is finding out um, and, and finding a way to better implement. Like I said, I had already praised the, the probate court here uh, in the city of Worcester because I think they do a great job in our county mm -hmm. to to do the best they can with the volume of um, cases that come in because we have a very high volume of pro se litigants too that come in that um, you know sometimes those cases because obviously they're not familiar with the procedure right. you know how, how the process works so they walk into the court and, and you know they need some guidance into into um, how to get their case. To move forward yeah. so I think that's going to be a, a biggest challenge um, that I see is case management of um, mm -hmm. how we get people um, the hearings they need and they deserve in a, in a timely manner mm -hmm. I, I, I think those are great points that you brought up I also think you're a good age to be going to this court um, as, as I caution everyone going to any bench today but particularly to this court make sure you have your support system strong and intact because I think this is extraordinarily difficult work which you know people don't always understand and emotions run high as they do in any court but in this court with guardianships and such it, it, it really is can be very challenging on all fronts um, do you think your work as a bar advocate helped prepare you for this absolutely I think it prepared me because I had that. It was a great opportunity for me. It was one of, um, I don't want to see the smartest things I've done, but it was yeah. it was very daunting as a new lawyer just passing the bar. I passed the bar in 99, yeah. and I began as a bar advocate in, I believe, the summer of 2000. I also, as a side note, happened to be uh, six months pregnant at the time. Um, so I was coming into trial for it as a new lawyer. Um, but it gives you such an experience of being in the courtroom. It yeah. learned, you learn demeanor, you learn process, you learn um, to be quite frank, how to stand and present a case to a judge. Right. Um, the jury trial experience, although limited, was um, invaluable to know how to argue a case in front of a jury, um, how to prepare for that, how to impanel a jury. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was a fantastic opportunity, and I absolutely think it helped me when I got to uh, practice when I decided to come more into the probate and family court, where you are in court so so much. There's right. so many court appearances that I had the experience of doing that as my advocate was, was invaluable. Well, you're clearly well prepared for this position, I think. Um, I, I, you know, I think you're a good age. I think you've got a great background. I think being a bar advocate is helpful. I think being a woman who's gone to law school at night and, and you know having children at the same time, uh, you know, my sister did the same thing. But actually, actually went to school full time and worked full time. It's, I, I mean, I don't know how you do it, um, but it's no small feat in in organizational skills and, and time management. Which I think you're. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear you refer to the docket and. Also, the acknowledgement of the number of 
particularly in this book, I'm saying it again, is because it's, um, it, it's daunting. And I find the few times that I've been in the probate court for any reason that um, the staff in the courts are really tremendously helpful and, and very kind. Albeit, it's got to be some of the most frustrating work that you could possibly do. Um, and I'm sure not everyone has their best day every day, but I am always impressed at the professionalism of, of the staff. So um, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much, Bill. It's a career. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you talking to me the other day. Um, some couple things you know, we talked briefly about. I can't overstate um, the, you know, my own personal thing that I went through 18 years ago. When my wife and I were sent to a gun in Lightning in Boston and spent thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars for someone to meet with both of us and determine who should have custody of our three daughters. And they came back and they recommended joint physical custody. And my wife and I agreed to that. I went before the judge who ostracized me and my family. And we signed a petition and was yelling and screaming how joint physical custody doesn't work. And I can tell you, I was a cop for 30 years as a police chief. I never felt so humiliated and so frustrated in my entire life. Standing before a guy who's telling me that I can't see my kids, half time. When I had bought a house, two houses away. So um, I hope you're a believer in joint physical custody when everything else is even playing field. Absolutely, Tom. That that is I think that's what should be the state of the law in the Commonwealth right now. It's not a uh, automatic, so to speak, but uh, if, if if I am confirmed, absolutely my position would be when people come in on any custody matter, um, barring any other evidence, why shouldn't they come in in an equal plane? What was, and, and just to, if I may, to uh, allude to your, to your facts in the case, especially when people come in with an agreement. I mean, that it would be, it's wonderful when I see people come in with, you know, with other attorneys and, and I can work out an agreement. I mean, that is the best case scenario 99% of the time because you know your children, you know your family, you know what's best for your, your, your parents. So absolutely, I, I, I would, my starting point would be shared parenting. Yeah, no, we would sign it. Let's go back a few times, actually, and give them more and more and more. And uh, it was just a humiliating process. And, um, you know, being talked about. Um, so it's near and dear to my heart. The good news is, we were here 17 years later, I have three great children. Never once was there a custody dispute. It was going to happen for Christmas, Thanksgiving. I mean, it was perfect. It was really physical custody. Um, so I really do that. Um, the other thing we talked about briefly, I think, is um, once kids turn 18, um, you know, I saw in one of your, one of your uh, cases with your father, I think the dad ended up getting some credit for paying for college. And um, are you are you in favor of some direct payments or at least some credit to the poor once the kid turns eighteen, so that maybe the kids in school are away for forty two weeks a year, and the payee is not collecting all the money and doing whatever they want with it. Are you in favor of an offset or some kind of arrangement where the kid would actually get the advantage of having the child support paid to him or her? I am in favor of that. I, I am in favor. What I see from, especially I would say in the last two or three years. Um, a case I had recently in the last three months is the credit. When you say the credit, um, judges are wanting to hear, okay, we have a child who's 18. First of all, why why are they still covered under the child support? What is the reason for the defendant? Because that's a, that's one of the requirements to have a child support on, on 18 is the they're dependent on one of the parties who's receiving the support. So I think it's important to look at that. What is the reason? Is the reason because they're in school? You know, what is the reason? Um, at that point, my in my practice, I see the majority of these cases because children are in school, uh, college most of the time, that, and you are paying for all types of things once the children get to college age. We're paying for, um, you know, their cell phones. We're paying for. We're paying for car insurance when they drive. We're paying for tuition, books, all those, all those expenses. I'm but, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm seeing the courts asking more now is. They want evidence and information about who's paying what. The child has a car, or they bought, even if they don't own the car, the car insurance, as many of us know, for a, a, an 18 year old. Um, it, who's paying the 2500 The court wants information on that. Who's paying, who's paying the cell 
on bills, who's paying the extracurricular, who's paying the, the um, $2,500 car insurance uh, payment. They want to know that, and I think it's very fair to look at that in the context of what someone should be paying to support, regardless of what the guidelines are. That the guidelines, um, you know, June of 2018, a new set of guidelines came out specifically targeting one of the areas they targeted, which is children over 18, with the 25% reduction in the formula. If you look at the formula, though, when I say I'm not good at math, you really have to be a math major. <laughs> they, they were trying to simplify the guidelines, and they went from one page to two pages. Now the guidelines are two page form if you try to complete. Um, but I think the intent was, and I think that the mathematics will work. so much. Um, I think you have a great judge. I, I do um, appreciate your answers and sincerity. And um, <clears throat> I'm a good judge of character. And I think you believe what you, you just told me about, um, you know, child support and who should be allocated and how people should look deeper into issues to make sure that everyone's on the right playing field. And, and I got to say that uh, the counsel to my left, which is the only good advocate here, is this person. Oh, thank you. I'm an attorney, but I've never done a divorce case, and I don't know much about the divorce case. Just to follow up on Counselor uh, Barras on the child support, well, you're talking about maybe give the uh, pay you a credit under certain circumstances. Let's assume the payor is making eight hundred thousand a year. Do you still give a credit, or are you talking? You say a credit. Does it make a difference if the payor is making eight hundred thousand, or if he's making fifty thousand? Because the law is what it is. Well, it does make a difference. It would, in my view, it would make a difference. The guidelines only apply to the first two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of combined income. Above that, it's all discretionary from the court. Um, I, I, in that scenario, I, I would like to see what the. I'm sorry. I can't What's the sum of recipients paying eight hundred thousand? Recipients paying one hundred and fifty. Um, I do think that it would be a different scenario when there's that ability to, uh, of the funds available to look at. I, I would still do the same analysis as the bottom line. If, I, if that was a case in front of me, I would still do the same analysis. I'm not sure the amount of the credit that but I might you, get. So you could think of, in my in my hypothetical, <clears throat> the pay was making eight hundred thousand. Pay you receiving uh, is making one hundred and fifty thousand. You would still give <coughs> some type of credit uh, to the payor. Like you talk about uh, car 
insurance, South Carolina bill, everything? I don't, I think I would have to hear from the witnesses, weigh the evidence, and I, in that scenario, what would you want to hear? Um, what is mother, assuming it's, a, and I don't mean to, assuming it's the recipient issues. What is the recipient <coughs> is, is the recipient paying anything to support the recipient? Are they, are they paying anything additional on top of, you know, are they paying anything when they You said the recipient paid. The person receiving the child. Oh, the recipient's going to say, he lives with me. The kid's in college. When he or she comes home, I gotta feed the kid. I gotta give them. They got a bed upstairs. They got this four or five family house because of you know Johnny and me. And if that's the evidence that I heard, then I probably wouldn't be inclined to give credit. Okay. I guess it's probably not credit. The other question, Councilor Juvenville asked that I was confused about: alimony shall stop at retirement. Correct? Yes. And I was confused if somebody comes in, let's say somebody, the payee comes in for a modification, and you have two months left before the payor uh, is at retirement age. Why do we care about financials? I, I, that's what I was totally confused about. Why the payee's attorney wants the financials of the payor. You're going to let them have it? You have two months left before retirement. Well, I think I would do what um, I had discussed with Council Juvenile the fact that if that, if that modification is filed before the retirement date, I think you said two months before the recipient comes in and files the mod asking for, are they asking for a, an extension in your scenario? Or they're, they're, either one, either an extension. Or, or a uh, already percent. We're not talking about the disabled person. Right. Or, you know, Just, yeah. You know what I'm saying. And you know how long these cases take to, to be heard. And they, they want discovery. We've got two months left. You know how long discovery takes. I, I think that I would not open, I would not um, allow the discovery <coughs> to take place at that time. I would clearly the person entitled to a hearing up until the fact of retirement age told when, when the gentleman or the, or the woman turns um, full Social Security retirement age. Then um, I believe that in that, that case, would I would make a determination on that the shall terminate section first before I'd make any determination. And if I found that it shall terminate, there's no issue to hear the second case on the issue of I, I, I get that. But I guess my question is the need comes. Let's assume my hypothetical is right. Okay. Both pay off and payee or recipient, whatever whatever the terminology is, perfectly healthy. Okay? Payor is now turns retirement age. And he comes in and says, Whoa, I'm getting four thousand dollars a week for alimony. I got a house in Florida, I have a country club, I have another house in uh, in uh, you know up north in North Conway. I gotta keep this lifestyle going. Nothing to do with need, disability, but Basically, to maintain the lifestyle. That's what, what you do point out. I and mean, the payor is making eight, nine hundred thousand. He's got plenty of money. And so, must even make it easy. Sorry to interrupt you. The payee's not working. I think it's clearly, in that scenario, it's clearly a, a termination case. Because the, uh, and, and I'm assuming we're all talking the, uh, a, a divorce prior to the 2012. Um, reform act because people now people um i'm sorry i'm in that perspective that's a perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. um that they are aware that that is the law it's terminated so they have every opportunity during their initial divorce proceeding to negotiate to do whatever they have to do for their future planning knowing that when the payor turns full social security retirement age be it 66 67 i know that it's just because yeah, yeah, of the date of birth yeah, yeah. um that will terminate, that that seems, order will terminate. It seems like someone who gets divorced close to the spouse's retirement age, that could be a difficult scenario because they, I, I, again, they say 66, 65, you know, 166, 165, they're getting close to retirement age. I assume they split the assets. 
and then they make it so they make they split the is that right? They split the, the assets 50 50. Um, I had a recent case, um, that had to that similar scenario. My, my client happened to be the payor, and he was going to retire in four years. Um, and what they did because they know it's and I don't mean to be it's not a secret what's going to happen when he turns those yeah. over. I mean, she got a disparate um, division of the assets, knowing that. Is that fair? Is that, is that I, I thought they had to split them 50 50. No, they don't have to split them. We're an equitable distribution state, not a community property state. It's not community property as in 50. It's equitable division. division. It's what's fair and equitable. And in, in that case. So the older you are, the older like the payor will call it. Is closer to retirement age, the vision of property, he may pay a higher percentage than he would have if he was 20 years younger. Correct. It may be a 60 40 split of the marital asset state, knowing that alimony's stopping in four years, than it would be if the person was 20 years younger. I would, I would agree okay. with that. I, I didn't realize that. Okay. When we talk about parenting, Let's say someone's in the seventh grade, eighth grade, there's two kids. Contested. Both spouses, a great deal. Just can't get along. What is your sense on a parenting plan where it gets contested, one party more, the kids all the time? How far away are the kids? How far away do they live from the other spouse? That you would give well. First of all, would you, well, would you ever give a 50-50 parenting plan? Or the, Absolutely. You're not going to give a 50-50 parenting plan if they live two hours apart. Right. I know it's a difficult question. We got someone in the seventh grade and the eighth grade. Okay. They obviously live near the school is near one of the spouses. How far away is too far? We're talking about a commute, whatever average commute is, you know, Monday through Friday. You know, we miss traffic, there's no, it's an average commute. We both agree two hours too far, it's too long. What's the limit for you to get, you're gonna make that decision, how far can they live apart that you would order 50 50? I don't think there's an exact. No, but both, give me a I second. would say a half hour. I've had cases where, many, many cases over the year, uh, years with joint shared custody. And I, I think that, on because we're talking about school days, I, that's usually the issue, Cal, you get them yeah. to school on time for seventh and eighth grader or whatever grade they might be in. My experience is usually in that half hour, um, maybe 40 minutes max. When you start getting into the 45 minute hour range, I had a case uh, last year with Worcester. Uh, they got divorced when they both lived in Worcester. Father moves to Mattapoisa. They never come in. Of they, of course. they never come and change it. So for one school year, the children are getting up some morning, they, and they stay in school in Worcester because they don't want to leave school. So three days a week, they're driving from Mattapoise in the evening to the Worcester Public School System. Three days a week. And when I got involved in the case, I I, I didn't think that was because it was too far. It, it's, it's just, but they were but they had agreed upon it. Well, then the agreement broke down after a year, and they thought and a, a complaint modification was filed. So, I, right, because it did say that, at least I'm hearing from you, that if the kids live 40 minutes away in a contested situation, <laughs> that it's very likely, uh, again, as long as the parents and the kids like both parents, that you would order uh, a 50-50 parent. Under that scenario, if there were no other outstanding issues, absolutely. From someone, as a side note, who had a 45 minute bus ride to school every morning. I, I went to school in a region and school district, um, and I had a 45 minute bus ride um, every morning to school because of the regionalization where I lived as a child. Um, that was my community. Mine was long, too. You know, I had to walk to the bus stop, you gotta wait for the bus. Right. You gotta take the bus over here, then you gotta wait for the trolley in those days, and you gotta take the trolley. I, I you know, I'm gonna guess. I heard Council Farr mention joint legal and physical custody. What does those words mean to you? Joint legal custody is decision making, usually involving educational issues with your child's medical issues, 
legal issues, if there's any legal issues that come up, it's the, it's the ability to be an equal part of the other parent. You and the other parent have equal say in issues involving your children's education and medical education. Yeah, but when, you know, I think when people hear the term joint physical and legal custody, they mean 50-50, but that's not what the law is. Is that right? Correct. Right. So joint physical custody could be 80-20. To me, that's, I know on paper, it, yeah, it is joint, but bullshit is joint. A lot of clients who come to see me originally don't know, right, they say, I want, I think I have joint custody. And then I'll look at what their scenario is, and I have to explain to them well, under the court, you know, under the what the law is, you have joint legal custody, but you, you probably don't have joint physical custody. And you're someone who likes 50-50 shit, because that's I'm, if you know where I'm coming from. I'm a strong believer in I'm an advocate for children's uh, rights, even though I don't handle these in this case, I never have. Uh, you you come from? I do come from that. I haven't, in my years of practice, I haven't seen when there's two um, healthy parents involved, active, loving parents, I haven't seen children that have suffered from their parents being equally involved in their lives. So I absolutely do that. Now, the alimony reform act, what was that, two, three years ago? In 2012. Okay, more six years ago. And they set guidelines how to determine alimony and child support. Obviously, when they did that, they took into, I'm sure, the tax consequences. Because in 2012, alimony was deductible and child support was not. And those formulas, and I could be wrong, have not been changed? They have not. They have not been changed. The tax yeah. have not been changed. Okay. So alimony, whatever that formula is, it's the same today as it was five years ago. Yes. And obviously, we know alimony no longer what, this year, 2019, or 18, whatever, is no longer deductible. First of all, do you have the power? I mean, the statute says this is the formula. Is, can you deviate from that formula to take into consideration the new tax consequences? Yes, the alimony formula is discretionary. It's unlike Why the child. Why do we have everything? You said that word, kind of discretionary. Why do we have anything? Well, the in contrast to the child support formula, we talk about math. That is mandatory. That is to be used in every case. Of course, then you have discretion, but it's yeah. a mandatory number that should be the, the order bar. Alimony is different, that formula. That's a discretionary formula to let the court look at that 30 to 35 percent delta between the parties. Um, that That's the, uh, the tax ramifications um, is something that is a cutting edge issue in the probate family court right now because of the January 1st. Yeah. Tax comes into effect June 1st, 19? 1 19. Yeah. Well, let me ask this. Um, math is not one of your best subjects. Now, you've, you've said that. I, I, you said it yourself. You don't know. It's got, and I mean this in a polite way. That could be a challenge for someone like you, and I'm sure a lot of people. Now, someone comes in, I'm making this, I got you know, my tax court, you know. I, that's not going to be as easy as looking at a formula now. Now you're going to say, okay, under the formula, uh, you know, the payor is going to pay $1,825. But uh, the payor is not going to get the deduction, so now I've got to reduce the $1,825 to $11. That's not going to be easy. You feel confident that you can do it? And how do you go about Where do you get the instruction? What's, what are they talking about? I mean, I don't do probate work. That seems like a big deal to me. I had the fortune last month of going to a seminar with a bench bar committee with members of the probate, sitting justices of the probate court um, that take questions from the bar about issues that are coming. And I can tell you the first questions in the room were, what are we doing about the taxation, yeah. uh, the loss of tax deductibility to uh, payors and the, the flip side. The, the income is no longer income on the other side. So um, I was told that they don't have an absolute solution to that right now, the justices, they're going to be looking for practitioners to get opinions from, which not everyone can afford to do, huh? from the huh? accountant, exactly. Well, you know, as well as that, this accountant's going to say A, and this accountant's going to say B. They both, can't, they both can't be right. That's going to be a challenge. It is going to be 
a challenge. And I, I think it's definitely, like I said, cutting edge on the forefront of how is that going to be addressed? Because it, it, in my opinion, it would be inherently unfair to use the existing I formula, the as you formula. point out, because that assumes tax deductibility to the pay to the payor, um, and you're also, you know, with a big windfall for the for the payee. Now we're switching it and swinging it to the same tax treatment as child support, which is, you know, after one one nineteen, exactly. and, and that is a big change in the law. Um, so absolutely, I think we'd be uh, we'd be looking for obviously educating ourselves as if I'm confirmed as members uh, of the judiciary, but also looking. We have cases where people come in represented by counsel and maybe have the means to get some guidance from a tax expert on, well, this is what you were, well, this was your tax benefit when you were paying X amount in alimony, and now this is what you're going to lose losing that deductibility. What do you do when two pro se people come in? And, you know, one Johnny says, oh, yeah, his buddy's making the same as me, he's paying me this, and then. You give them advice on that? Well, I don't want to I, I think it would be improper to give them advice. That, that wouldn't be my job yeah. if I was a member of the judiciary. Seems like someone would <laughs> be unfair for one side or whatever. Well, that's when, absolutely, I think. It, and that's when, like I said, I think uh, members of the judiciary also have to educate themselves about what that is going to look like, those tax ramifications. We also have an excellent um, lawyer for a day program in Worcester. We have the court clinic. There's an actual facility on the first floor of the of the complex um, where people can go in and um, sit with someone and have, you know, get at least some basis yeah. of legal knowledge. Okay, yeah, I don't have any further questions, but that's going to be a challenge. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I know Council Kennedy. I don't have any questions here, just a comment, a couple of comments. Um, I obviously know uh, Dean Rackley. I think he has uh, some uh, tremendous things to say about you. And he has some dealings to you're a great candidate. Your, your council has been very, very supportive of you in this process. I want to point that out. Uh, and, um, we spoke on the phone. We had a very long conversation. We answered all my questions at that time. Uh, so I think you're an outstanding candidate. You have a great background. Thank you. Thank you, Council. 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 Thank you,
She had a family. She didn't have a friend. She had nothing there. And it was very clear it was indifferent. And this for me, it could be just a children. And um, I told, they say it's being eliminated, but every visitation is being eliminated. No camera in that visitation. That's not the word. So the judge gave the uh, visitation on the computer on 67. And I can't help it. And that's, you know, really was upsetting to me. So I'm glad I had your hands up. Because it was, it was nothing to do to say, yeah, to base it on and say that she deserves to be And uh, so that I was concerned about that. And I'm going to tell you another personal story that I think is going to be the first one on me. And uh, it really concerns me. And I want to know how you look at it. Um, and my husband is a firefighter. Mr. Franco is a firefighter. And his wife is a firefighter. They couldn't have children. So they adopted a 10 and 12 year old biological brother. And after a year that they were adopted, they were in the middle And the older boy said that they were in biological identification and so many times in the hospital. So he said that his father was sexual. Younger boys said, Daddy said, You can say that. So Frank and Lisa reported it. And it took one year and a half to stop this infant case of that biological abuse. And I want to know if that happened and you were a judge, what would you do if my friend Lisa came to you and told you that story? And if this is a side story, I just want to tell you. Told me that she always wondered why her boys, and they were four of them because they were not, you know, not always like the little boys. This was embedded in the mind. So, uh, what would you do if my friend Lisa came before you and told you the story and she wanted to return and raise the father's Well, I would not have to take years. I'd consider that scenario. I would definitely do my analysis would be the safety of the child or children as the first issue. That should always be in a, in a scenario that you describe. Um, it should always be the safety of the children. It should be first. Um, so I would say that in keeping in mind um, that everyone has a different process and it can be heard, I, my instinct is that I would issue an emergency order. Um, to stop the visit for a very short period of probation because it was in three days. So I've seen in three days that we get people back in so that both sides who can have service be on on his father who could come in then. And have, I'd like to see some evidence, you know, some testimony, weighing the way the credibility of the witnesses. Um, but that should be the utmost importance of this in a serious If they knew who she called me, I mean, I don't think it's really state ethics. I can't do it, and I felt guilty because we felt so bad, and that's how we felt. So I want to talk to that with that um, You know, um, I'm very involved in the medical care, and um, I'm in an organization, Women in Leadership, and I talk to the And uh, we have spread out even to other countries. It's, it's just amazing. And um, I think we've made some process progress, but not really. I still think it's not in favor of the father in so many cases. You know, so how many cases have you had? Or how many cases have you had in your So, um, has there been any joint custody that you were advocating that um, you failed and you need to next one here? And the result is you know, that you know, that influence. I mean, you have good cases and you're bad cases. What would be the, the worst scenario for the joint custody cases? I have to think of one of them particularly, it was. Parents happen to be mother and father, and they were um, really sharing time. But the relationship 
know, I've said that the, the judge is, is a lot harder to be a judge today than it was, say, 30, 40 years ago. There's so many other um, things that have happened in our society. We uh, had, you ever had a gay couple that came before you and they were divorcing and they had a child? And perhaps the, I don't know if that, I think you can tell me about that. And if one of the partners was the mother, a uh, biological mother of the child, how do you, have you had a case? I have. Yeah. Now that case is pending. 